So, so we just we start when the motion picture director tells us he's ready. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning worship service here at uh, 10th Street United Methodist Church. We're glad you're joining us today. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, for me, and Ed might have some in a moment too. Uh, we're going to be doing the Lenten Bible study starting Wednesday, March the 1st, and going through Wednesday the 29th, the five Wednesdays in March, at 7 o'clock each Wednesday night in Fellowship Hall. And we are using Adam Hamilton's newest book, which he wrote for a Lenten Bible study, which is a study on the Gospel of Luke called uh, Luke, uh, Jesus, and the Strangers, and Outcast. And uh, it's, uh, I, and the books have come in, I've got them on the back pew back there, and they cost $15, so uh, if you want to get you a copy of the book, uh, whenever you can, they'll be available here at the church, and we'll uh, hope to have you at the study, which starts uh, Wednesday, March the 1st. And uh, we always have a great time with these studies. Uh, people from Thrall come in and join us, and some people from First Church, and it's always good to get the different folks together, and we have a good time of fellowship and a good time of study, so we invite you to join us for that. And also, uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent, so we'll be uh, you know, going towards uh, Easter, which will be on April 9th, so uh, hard to believe it's already here, but it is. So, uh, uh, so we have some, uh, we'll have some good worship opportunities coming up. And I'll let Ed make any announcements he wishes to make, and then we'll begin our service, Ed. Uh, two <coughs> basic announcements. One, remember we voted last week, we're going to forego an Ash Wednesday service here. We invite you to go to either the Episcopal Church or First Church, wherever you want to go. If you want to go uh, for Ash Wednesday, uh, we just didn't have a overflow interest here in doing one here. But in lieu of that, uh, Travis and I got together and we're going to have an administrative board meeting online uh, Ash Wednesday evening at 7. So Ginger, if you'd send out notices to everybody about uh, Travis will uh, get the uh, Zoom Much better. Uh, Zoom uh, connection tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, yeah, and everybody should have it by Wednesday. And, and a board meeting can be an act of repentance in another Yeah, yeah. As Travis points out, a board meeting can be an act of repentance anyway. So uh, anyway, we don't have a lot to talk about. We just want to look ahead and see where we're going to go for the uh, through the spring and. Uh, financially and discuss where we are financially and that sort of thing which by the way we're, we're okay with that um, all of the uh, limbs have been uh, gathered up now they haven't been picked up here at church most of them have been picked up at the parsonage so we're in good shape there uh, are there any other announcements we need to be aware of congregation wise we're still hunting a pianist oh yeah we're hunting, still hunting a pianist. I made an approach uh, the other night at, at dinner, but uh, I didn't get a negative or a positive reply. It's one of those, I'll think about it, and so hopefully they'll think about it. All right, no other announcements? <clears throat> Why don't we stand and join our call to worship? God said, this is my son, the beloved, let us worship you, O beloved God. God said, Listen. We want to hear your word in me this day. God said, Do not be afraid. We lay our worries at your feet. And after all this was spoken, God was quiet. Still our souls, quiet our minds, and prepare us to be transformed, holy God. And our opening hymn is number 451 in the hymnal, but you see the words there. And Franklin, hopefully you'll lead us.
the D roads. Roads, okay. Uh, we'll remember Bertha Sestick and her daughter Dixie Rhodes. And uh, are there other prayer requests? Are there any birthdays or anniversaries in the week before us? I think Charlie is going to have a birthday this coming week, but he's not here today. Yeah, and uh, John has a birthday next Sunday, so mm -hmm. he's not here today. We'll, we'll sing happy birthday to him on his birthday. Uh, are there others? Michael? I just want to issue, uh, mention an, an item of praise. Uh, you know, I, I kind of had a rough few weeks there, and uh, the folks at my job were, uh, were really accommodating about it. And I just wanted to say that I'm thankful for my job. Uh, it's turned out to be really well. I haven't done one there for long, but uh, it's been a blessing. That's great. That's great. We agree with Joyce and that, Michael. Well, let's spend a moment in silent meditation and we can share with God whatever's on our hearts. And then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer and we'll join the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray.
You know, something like this can come in handy in emergency situations. You know, prayer is also like an emergency flasher. But we don't have to have batteries and a lantern to pray to God. We can pray to God anytime, wherever we are. And whenever we send out a request to God, God hears us. And we might, God may not answer immediately or in the way we think He should. But God always answers with our best interest at heart. And God loves us and cares for us. So whenever we are in desperate situations or we just need someone to talk to, we can always talk to God. Prayer is an emergency beacon that always works and that always gets us in touch with God. So thank you for being with us with your parents today. We're glad you're watching online. And we hope you have a great week. And the next time you use a lantern or a light of any kind, think about how prayer helps us get close to God and helps us stay in touch with God. I want to. And our next hymn is number 369, Blessed Assurance.
And after they finish the day, the farmer goes on his way. And Frost reflects in the poem how sad it is that the farmer has lived all his life at the foot of this magnificent mountain that people come from all around to see, but that he himself has never gone to the top to see for himself the beautiful view. You know, that's how it often is with we human beings. Sometimes we live in the presence of a magnificent thing, a wondrous thing, uh, an interesting thing that's right under our noses. And people come from all over to see it, but so often those of us who live right in the vicinity of it never take the time to familiarize ourselves with it. You know, I, uh, I've always been amazed that right here in Taylor, we have the Moody Museum in the boyhood home of Governor Dan Moody, who was the youngest governor in the history of the state of Texas, who was, when he was a district attorney, was the first person to successfully prosecute a case against the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, in fact, this week, or this, this year, marks the 100th anniversary of the trial in which Dan Moody successfully prosecuted uh, Ku Klux Klan members, first time that had ever been done in Texas. And uh, it's amazing that so many people that live right here in Taylor, when I talk to them, they say they've never visited the Moody Museum. Oh yes, we've heard about it. Uh, I mean, yeah, we've, we've driven by it. Yeah, we didn't mean to go see it, but we just never have got around to it. You know how it is, there's so much other stuff going on. And it's sad because it's a wondrous museum. Uh, Carol Ann and Susan and I are, are all on the Moody board, and it's a wondrous place. Uh, there's so many interesting artifacts, not only from Dan Moody's life, but from Taylor history and Texas history. It's one of the best preserved examples of an early Victorian, of a late period Victorian home that you are going to find right here in our own community. And people come from all over to visit it, but so sad and amazing that so many people who live right here in town have never seen it. But you know, that's how it is in our spiritual lives as well. God offers us spiritual mountains to climb every day. God has wondrous experiences that he wants to give us. And so often they are right before us. But we're so busy going about our daily activities that we don't take the time to pause and experience them. That day when Peter, James, and John went up to the summit of the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, we don't know what they were expecting, but they probably certainly weren't expecting what took place. Now, uh, Judea, Galilee, Israel, the Holy Land, Palestine, it's not very big. The whole country would fit into central Texas very easily. And probably Peter, James, and John had walked by that mountain, maybe even climbed up it before in their lifetimes. Imagine what would have happened if when Jesus invited them to go up to the mountaintop with him, if they said, Lord, we're kind of busy. Uh, we've been up that mountain before, and uh, you go ahead, Lord, go up there and pray, and we'll keep watch for you down here. If they had missed done that, they would have missed out on a life-changing experience. Seeing Jesus revealed before their eyes in all his heavenly glory. Seeing Moses and Elijah appear to endorse Jesus' chosen path of ministry. Talk about a celebrity endorsement. And it changed their lives forever. Years later, when Peter wrote his second epistle, he would remember that day on the mountaintop with Jesus. And he would refer to it as a lamp that had shone in the darkness over the years, giving him courage on difficult days. God often has spiritual mountains that are right before us that he wants us to climb, where God wants to speak to us and help us look at life and ourselves and others in a totally new way. 
Now they're not cataclysmic events, they're not mighty transfigurative events lots of times. God usually speaks to us through simple, everyday, ordinary people and experiences. But we need to prepare ourselves to be sensitive to when God wants to speak to us, to allow God to open our eyes to see what He wants to show us. And the way we do that is through practicing what John Wesley called the holy habits, prayer, Bible study, gathering for worship regularly with other Christians. Those are simple things. And you know, God doesn't speak to us in a marvelous way every time we do those things. But when we regularly do those things, when they become holy habits, as John Wesley called them, we are sensitizing ourselves to be more aware of God's presence, to be more aware of God's acting in our lives, so that when God speaks, we'll be more likely to be receptive. There was a man named Larry Walters who was a 30-something truck driver who lived in Los Angeles in 1982. Larry had a ritual. Every Saturday afternoon, he would get his lawn chair, sit in his backyard, and sip a cool beverage, and just zone out for a couple of hours and relax. But one day, Larry got to thinking that uh, he'd like to try something different. He'd like to see his neighborhood in a different way than just sitting there in his lawn chair every Saturday afternoon. So Larry decided that he would tie enough helium balloons to his lawn chair to lift his lawn chair up about a hundred feet over his backyard and then he'd have a bird's eye view of his whole neighborhood. Now Larry was not an aeronautical engineer so he had no idea how many weather balloons or helium balloons it would take to uh, lift his lawn chair up to a hundred feet. That didn't stop there. He went to the surplus store and bought 45 weather balloons and filled them up with helium. He got his neighbors to help him tie them to his lawn chair, which his neighbors then held down. Larry got a box of sandwiches, his cool beverage, and a BB gun so that he, when he was ready to come back down, he could shoot the balloons one at a time and lower himself back down to earth. And when Larry's friends at his signal released his lawn chair, to his amazement, it shot up 11,000 feet into the air. <laughs> Larry was terrified. He was so scared he didn't even think about using the BB gun to start shooting the balloons to bring himself back down. <coughs> All he could do was hold on to the lawn chair for dear life. Now, a DC-10 pilot flying into Los Angeles International Airport saw Larry and he called the air traffic control tower and reported that there's a guy up here in a lawn chair and he has a gun. <laughs> yes, Larry had flown right up into the middle of the busiest air traffic pattern in America. And so police helicopters and rescue helicopters were scrambling. The air traffic controller rerouted all aircraft around the area. The police cordoned off the neighborhood down below. And when the police helicopters determined that Larry was not a threat to anyone, the rescue helicopters helped him get his lawn chair safely back down to Earth. And once he got back down to Earth, reporters who had heard about what was happening swamped him, hundreds of reporters. And also a number of policemen who wrote all kinds of citations for him. <laughs> the reporters asked Larry, were you afraid? Larry said, no. Would you do it again? And Larry said, no. And then they asked, well, why did you do it? And Larry said, because you can't just sit there. Now, what Larry did was not wise. He could have killed himself or injured himself. He could have killed or injured someone else. He did disrupt air traffic for miles around and cause a lot of worry and anxiety. But something was stirring deep within Larry. 
that caused him to realize there was more to love than just sitting in a lawn chair. That there's more to life. There's a better way to look at life. There's a way to see more of the wonder in life. One night a man checked into a hotel very late in the evening. He went up to his room and settled in and then decided that before the lounge closed he would go down and relax and have a drink before he went up to his room to go to bed for the night. Later that night, the man called the front desk and says, What time does the lounge open in the morning? And the young desk clerk replied, At nine o'clock, sir. He thanked the desk clerk and hung up. A few hours later, he called back, What time does the lounge open in the morning? It still opens at nine o'clock, sir. A couple hours later, he called back, What time does the lounge open in the morning? Still nine o'clock, sir. This went on all night. Well, just before the young desk clerk that went off his night shift early the next morning, uh, the hotel manager came on to relieve the young desk clerk, asking how he'd gone during the night. And the young clerk said, well, fine, sir, except there's this crazy guy who keeps calling every few hours asking when the lounge is going to open. I told him 9 o'clock, but he keeps calling and asking. At about that time, the man called again. It was about 7 in the morning. And the hotel manager picked up the phone, and the guy says, What time is the lounge open, please? And the hotel manager said, Look, you, you've been pestering my night clerk all night long. He's told you again and again, the lounge will open at 9 o'clock. You can't get in before then. And the man said, I don't want to get in. I want to get out. <laughs> The man had been in the locked in the lounge, but instead of reaching out, he thought all he could do was just sit there and wait for someone to open the door for him. There's more to life than just sitting there. Jesus called Peter and James and John, and he calls us as well to allow him to open our eyes to see the glory of God all around us to see the glory of God's image in others, to see possibilities that we've never seen before. There was a fourth grade teacher in Decatur, Georgia, who one day had her students, 10 years old, most of them, write down a list of I can'ts, as she called it. List down, list all the things you think you can't do. And so the 10-year-old students began to furiously write things like, I can't hit a softball past second buzz. I can't get Debbie to like me. I can't do long division past three numbers. And the teacher wrote her I can't do list as well. She wrote, I can't get John's mother to come in for a parent-teacher conference. I can't get my daughter to fill up the car. I can't get Ricky to understand that he could use words instead of fists. And when they were all through with their I can't list, the teacher said, okay class, let's do it. She had an open shoebox on her desk. And the students all came forward and they and the teacher put their I can't list in the shoebox, which the teacher closed and sealed. Then the teacher picked up a shovel and she said, let's go class. And they all marched out to a far end of the schoolyard where the teacher dug a hole with a shovel. The students took turn digging the hole. Together they were all digging the grub. And when they dug a nice grave, as the students stood by and watched, the teacher reverently put the shoebox in the grub. And then she and the students each took turns with the shovel shoveling dirt in the grave and filling it up. And then the teacher said, class, let's join hands and bow our heads. They formed a circle around the grave they had just dug and they held hands and as they bowed their heads, the teacher gave the eulogy. We are here today to pay our final respects to I can. During his lifetime, he touched the lives of every person on earth in one way or another, some more so than others. I can is survived by his lesser known siblings, I can, 
I will, and I'm going to try. They are not as well known or as powerful as I can't was, but with our help in time, they might become so and be able to make an even bigger influence on the world for good that he made for bad. So we put I can't here to rest in peace. And now may we all pick up our lives and carry on without him. And then they all marched back into the classroom where they had cookies and punch and popcorn. The teacher cut a big uh, tombstone out of a gray piece of construction paper. She wrote R.I.P. at the top of the tombstone and I can't beneath it and beneath I can't's name the day's day. Then she packed it up on the bulletin board where it stayed for the rest of the year. And throughout the school year, whenever a student said that he or she couldn't do something, the teacher would point to the tombstone, reminding them that I can't is dead and gone. And the student would smile and say, well, I will try until I can. It changed their outlook on life. Jesus wants to open our eyes to the possibilities. He wants us to climb the spiritual mountains he has for us that are all around us through prayer, Bible study, worship, to allow him to open our eyes to see life, ourselves, and the world in a new way. Russell Schrinker was an astronaut who piloted the lunar module for the Apollo 9 mission. And in his memoirs, he told about how his life was forever changed by seeing the Earth from the heavens, as was the case for many astronauts. He says, up there you orbit around the Earth every hour and a half. You have your breakfast while looking out the window at the Middle East. You see the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt, Israel, Greece, Rome. You realize you're seeing the whole history of human civilization. By lunchtime, you're going over North America. <coughs> you see Los Angeles, Phoenix, um, Dallas, New Orleans, Miami. <coughs> and then by supper time, you're back over the Middle East again. You realize how small the Earth is. And you realize you've crossed over thousands of boundaries that you can't even see from space. <coughs> boundaries that are imaginary but that people have been fighting over for thousands of years and you realize more than ever that we are one that the earth is one that we're all part of God's family you don't need a Saturn V rocket to have a new view of the world around us all you need is to let Jesus open our eyes let Jesus help us see new possibilities. May we do so as we journey through this week. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 349, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's all stand together and sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will bring strangely him in the light of his glory and grace. And now may the grace of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and stay safe.